Hi everyone, this is Yael Averbush West. Welcome back to Football Americana, a 90 Min podcast. My next guest is Crystal Dunn. She called in from active U.S. women's national team duty with her unique perspective and usual charm. Excited for you all to listen in. This episode was recorded on September 20th, 2021. I'm very excited to talk to my good friend, Crystal Dunn, from New York originally, which you'll be able to tell by her lovely accent at times. Um, Crystal, I learned a little bit about your youth uh, and high school career. I didn't realize you only lost two games in your in three seasons of high school soccer, which is amazing. Uh, went on to when I really got to know you, have a st- historic career at University of North Carolina, and then to be the first pick in the 2014 NWSL college draft for the Washington Spirit, where you scored the, fir- the franchise's first hat trick. And now eight years later, I still remember back to your first year as a pro when we were <laughs> teammates and carpooling to training every day. But since then, you've also done a little thing like won the World Cup. <laughs> and you have, I believe, unless um, it's been unless you've gotten more since 123 caps, is that still correct? Or is it? Okay. I got that right. right. I was like, cause she's racked up more since then. Um, and 23 goals for the U S women's national team and currently playing professionally for the Portland thorns. So this is the current list of accomplishments among many others that I'm sure, uh, is still very much in the works, but really excited to have you, um, on it for this conversation. And just want you to start talking a little bit about your soccer upbringing. Like what was it like growing up in New York and what was your youth soccer? experience like? Yeah. Oh my goodness. Well, thank you so much for that intro. It takes me back to kind of, you know, remembering all the things that I've been, you know, really fortunate to achieve in my, in my life. So, you know, thank you for that. Um, but yeah, as a young girl, I grew up in a small town called Raffle Center, New York. Um, it's on Long Island. My parents moved out to Long Island from Queens. Um, and that is where I first fell in love with soccer. Um, you know, I really, stand by this notion that I wouldn't have really found soccer if it wasn't for my family moving out to Long Island. Um, just being in the city, you know, there wasn't really a whole lot of organized sports there, especially soccer. Uh, you need fields, you need space. Um, and that just wasn't the case um, way back when. So yeah, I'm really fortunate that my parents really wanted a better life for my brother and I, and they moved me out to Long Island. And um, that's where I fell in love with soccer. <laughs> Yeah. So speak a little bit about, you know, what, what caused you to fall in love with the game? You know, who, who, what were you, was it your youth coaches? Was it your family environment? Like what was really that spark for you as to why I'm I'm sure you were very good, but why did you (laughs) particularly love it so much? (laughs) I mean, who knows if they're good at anything at age, like four or five, I mean, you know, but no, I think for me, it just, I had a lot of energy as a kid. And I think it was a sport where I felt like kids were running around, they were able to exert themselves and like have fun with their friends. And that's really what drew me to the sport was just oh my gosh, everyone looks like they're having fun. And that's what I wanted. You know, I just wanted to have fun. I'm sure my parents were really happy I was out of the house and I was able to, you know, exercise and things like that. But, you know, it was a sport that just felt, it it seemed so carefree and it it seemed like you can express yourself at even such a young age. And I think I, I really enjoyed that. You know, it's funny you're talking about your energy, which wasn't just as a kid. You still have that great energy, <laughs> but it's true what you're saying about the sport in general and how active and imaginative it is. And it really mm-hmm. is a great fit for your personality. I never thought of it like that. Yeah. Um, but, you know, thinking about youth soccer, we all know, unfortunately, it's a it's a very white arena. Um, no better way to put it. Uh, so what was it like for you as a young black woman, you know, starting off? Was that something you noticed right away? Was it something you didn't really pay attention to in a little a little later? Later on, like I'm curious about your experience in that context. Yeah, I mean, I moved to Raffle Center, New York, as I, as I said before, and it was a predominantly white neighborhood. So, you know, before I even got into sports, I was kind of exposed to to the idea that I may be the only black kid in my school or in my class. And I think when I got into soccer, you know, I definitely noticed it. My parents noticed it. It was their job to obviously, you know, protect me and support me, even if I was the only black kid in that on that team, but, you know, I didn't let it affect me. It didn't change the way I, you know, it it didn't change my passion for the sport or or it it didn't make me feel like, oh, I don't belong. It was more so a feeling of, wow, like I'm the only one, like, I wonder why, you know, and as a kid, you don't really understand why you just, you know, you accept it, you embrace it. And then you kind of just go through life, just feeling like, okay, about the situation. Um, And I think, you know, as I got older, I started to realize like, why this sport is predominantly white. And and that's when I started to understand that, like, you know, I, as a black person 
have a, a level of privilege because my parents were able to afford uh, the, the the fees that were required to play club soccer and, and the travel expenses and things like that. So, you know, I think as I got older, I started to analyze my own life and realize, wow, like if my parents didn't have the funds to keep me in the sport, like I wouldn't have been able to stay in soccer, you know, no way. It's, it's, it's really expensive. Yeah. I think that's something, um, just a lot of us have started to realize who are fortunate to have like the, you know, travel to all these games and stuff. And now thinking, looking back, I realize how much all that costs. These are things you don't think of. Those cross country, like tournaments that your parents were flying. I'm like, we're flying to California. (laughs) (laughs) No, but it's true. That that is considered the norm. And and for many families, that's, uh, it makes it very exclusive, unfortunately. Um, Was this something that you guys as a family over time ever discussed? I know you said it's kind of, you just accept it and kind of went with it. But did, did you guys ever talk about that, you know, like on the drive to training or anything like that? Yeah. I mean, honestly, I think my parents really wanted to shield me from feeling like I didn't deserve to play this sport. You know, you know, I don't think my parents were struggling, but it definitely wasn't easy to pay for their kids to play travel sports, you know? So, you know, they kept whatever they were feeling about it to themselves. I feel like as a kid in the back seat, we were just, you know, always happy going to these tournaments. And I not once thought, you know, that they were, they were sacrificing anything, you know, to me, I was just like, Oh, this is so cool. Like I get to go to these tournaments and my parents get to come and, and this is amazing. But like I said, it took me until I got older to realize, wow, they were sacrificing a lot. That, that was money that they were putting aside, you know, probably for my college tuition, but they were also managing like, Hey, this, you know, my daughter wants to play this sport and she loves it and she's good and she's passionate about it. So I want to keep her in this sport, you know, and, um, you know, it's, it's, it's unfortunate that the sport is exclusive. Um, you know, I think we have so much more growth to do as a, as a nation promoting this game, because if we want to say that this is everyone's game, like we have to like change the structure of it, you know, starting at the very lowest level. And, um, like I said, it took me until I was older to realize that. Yeah. And I definitely want to keep delving into your thoughts on, you know, how we could change the structure to to start to make these type of changes or to continue any progress that has been made. But I'm curious, you know, so so you're playing locally, you're, you love it because it kind of fits with your energy. You're out there running around. What's your first memory of thinking about us soccer? Do you have an early memory of, of what that meant to you? Uh, Great question. You know, honestly, I feel almost sometimes so guilty about saying this, but like, I really didn't know much about like the U S women's national team. I didn't watch a lot of soccer. I didn't um, know a lot about the sport even before I got into it. I mean, my parents are city kids. Like they were like, what soccer, what is this? Like, this looks fun. I've never seen this sport before, you know? And I also think it stems from like players not really looking like me and me feeling like I don't see myself in a lot of older players or players that like have paved the way for women's soccer, obviously. But I think as a kid, I used to always watch tennis. I used to love watching Serena Williams because to me, she was somebody who, who looks like me, who was passionate about her sport and who, you know, carried herself in a way that I was like, Oh, that's what I want to do when I'm, you know, older. Um, so I would say my first real memory of like the women's national team is obviously like them winning, um, the 1999 world cup, but it wasn't in that moment when they won, it was more so like the impact of that team success and like what it did for women's soccer. Yeah. That's so interesting that you say that. Cause I was going to ask you, you know, who were your role models growing up, but then mm-hmm. thinking now, I think what you shared is it, it's unfortunate that you didn't have, you know, soccer players who you could watch and feel like, Oh, that's me one day. But I'm just mm-hmm. thinking about how many millions of young girls see you as that. And the fact that you've been able to, since you started playing kind of transform what someone else's experience is going to be is, is really, really special. Um, so talking about you, as a player, kind of fast forwarding a little bit to the player you've become, what do you think makes you most special uh, on the field? Oh man. Yeah. When I look at my career and I, you know, just dive into like, you know, what I've been able to achieve, I feel like, you know, easy answer is like my versatility, you know, my ability to play in multiple positions and, you know, just be dropped on the field and be told, Hey, this is where we need you. And, you know, you're going to do well. We, we believe in your abilities to do this job. And, um, I think that's what made me stand out from a lot of players. Um, I still have mixed feelings about my versatility. I think 
it's kind of a love hate relationship. I think in one, in one way, it's made me feel unique, special, like, you know, put in another category, a separate category from most people. But at the same time, I feel like there is sometimes built up resentment about like why I'm not able to play one role and just get really amazing at one job. Because at the end of the day, it's like, I always feel like when I'm investing in one position, it's taking uh, time away from investing in another role, obviously. So, you know, when I'm playing in the league as a midfielder, I'm like, oh, this is great. This is exactly where I want to be. And then I come to the national team and I'm like working on crossing, uh, defending crosses. I'm just like, I haven't seen this picture in like literally months. So like now it kind of makes me feel like I doubt myself and my ability to be a really top world-class outside back because just the amount of reps, you know? So it's been a long journey. It's been a journey where I've had to embrace, accept, and, you know, teach myself that it is more of a blessing than a curse, but some days are not always easy. <laughs> yeah, no, it's so interesting that you say that because I, I knew that you felt that way about, you know, being versatile. And from the outside, everyone always sees it as such a positive quality. But mm-hmm. I, I think the more you talk to players who are considered versatile and play in all these spots, like most players don't actually want, really want that role or see it as very ideal. Um, was there a time in your career where you remember that that was, became part of your identity? Was it always kind of who you were? Or as a young player, were you playing one position? And then when you got to a higher level, it kind of changed. I think when I was younger, like when I was in youth national team camps, I definitely was moved around a lot. And I think at that point I was just so excited and happy to be on youth national teams that I was like, this is great. I'm playing like, yay. You know, that was my mentality. And I think when I went to um, college, obviously UNC, Anton recruited me as a forward slash midfielder. And I was like, yes, this is amazing. And then my freshman year, there's a bunch of injuries and I have to play outside back. So it kind of was like freshman year, I was like, this is my year to like break out into the scene and, you know, be this goal scoring machine, this, you know, this assist machine. And then I was kind of like, well, bummer, I'm playing outside back. Like, this is not how I wanted my, you know, college debut to be. So I think my early years at UNC definitely prepared me for what was soon to come. But like I said, it's kind of like you embrace it, but you some, some days you just don't want to embrace it. You want to fight it, you know? So, um, I have a lot of years under my belt, obviously with being versatile, but it definitely doesn't make things easier, um, as well. Yeah, no, that, that that totally makes sense. I think it's part of it that people just don't really think about, you know, you you always think, oh, well, she can play anywhere. It's great. She gets more playing time. But then the reality is, like you said, it's hard to focus on, you know, being your absolute best at one thing because you don't know which one to to pick. Yeah, I think another thing too, is like, it's also been hard for me to feel like I can market myself in the right way. Like, I think when people see someone who's a goal scorer or a forward, it's easy to say like, this is what this person does. They are a goal scorer. And then with me, it's kind of like, I can be that I can be a midfielder. I could be a defender. Like, how do you actually market a player like that? And so I really struggled, I think with my identity and who I am as a player. And I just feel like, yeah, it's been a long road, especially when you make it onto the national team, there's already this huge spotlight. So you want to be seen in the way that you want to be seen, but then you can't help where you play. You can't help the amount of playing time you get or where you play, obviously. So it's kind of like you just have no control over a situation that you just want to take back control over, you know? Yeah. And and I think I really admire that, you know, you've spoken publicly about some of that and how you feel like you should be more the face of what's going on at U.S. soccer. And and there's all these, like you're explaining, there's a a number of conflicting things. One um, from, you know, reading what you've said, it has to do with being a black woman. Um, on mm-hmm. the team. And then the other side too, is like, you're saying like your specific role, have you, do you feel like since you've said things publicly about that, there has been a change? Have, have you, do you feel differently about it at all? Or do you feel still feel like it's kind of a struggle to kind of uh, build out your lane in all of this? Um, I don't think much has changed since I like made that art, uh, spoke um, to the Forbes uh, reporter, but I do think I feel like I walk around with way less weight on my shoulders. You know, it was almost like that was the first time I was able to really say what I meant and how I feel. Um, I think a lot of the times on the national team, you just want to like survive in the environment. You don't even like think about thriving. You're just really trying to like stay afloat. You're trying to like stay in the environment. Um, And I think that was the first time that I felt like I have reached a level on this team and in my career where I finally feel like 
I'm going to say how I feel this because it's just, there's so much weight on my shoulders at all times. And even though I don't feel like much has changed or how I'm perceived, I still feel like I needed to do that. You know, I needed to, to, to find that moment, find that strength to voice how I feel. Cause I stand by it. Um, I think there needs to be way more diversity in our sport still. And that's not just as players, but that's just, uh, that's just about, you know, who's on our day-to-day st- uh, staff. That's, you know, assistant coaches, that's, you know, medical staff, that's, you know, media. Like to me, when I speak of diversity and we need more of it in our sport, like obviously, yes, it's easy to say, yeah, we need more players. We need uh, people to be involved in the sport uh, who come from different backgrounds, of course. But to me, like being a part of this team, it's like, I'd love to see people who look like me taping my ankles or taking photos of me or speaking, uh, uh, reporting uh, some, some stories in this environment. So that's, I think, where I really want to, like, hopefully try to lead this game um, in a better place when I found it. And, and that's when I, yeah, that's the what I am most passionate about is getting that diversity in those areas. Yeah. So and this is something I definitely wanted to ask you about. So how, how does that happen in your mind? Like, how can we all support that? And I, I know you're a huge part, I think, by being there and by being amazing and what you've achieved, that's already, you know, pushing the envelope. But what needs to happen for that to be the reality, you know, and how long does it take five years, 10 years, 50 years? What do you think? I mean, I'd like to believe it shouldn't take that much time, but I think to have long lasting change, sometimes it is a process. It's not as simple as like, you know, the next day things can be drastically different. I obviously don't know if that could be the case, but it starts with the interviewing process. It's like, who are we interviewing for these jobs? Are we making sure that when there is a vacant, um, job offer uh, out there that it's going to everybody, you know, and I think it starts with that, making sure that everyone has the opportunity to be seen and to, to try out for this role. But yeah, I think just it, there could be multiple things that could take place, but I am very aware that it might not come overnight. Um, Hopefully throughout my time playing soccer, it can come. But I think, like I said, as long as I am a part of this team, I'm going to always fight for uh, more diversity, both, both on the field and off the field. Yeah. And I, I'm going to circle back to that because I want to talk a little bit more about like the general culture of U.S. soccer and, and some uh, some future elements of it and the part that you think you're going to play. But before we kind of go there, I'm curious, you know, thinking about you as a player and specifically about technique and like you're talking about your um, versatility as a player. I want to hear a little bit about your time in England and some of your observations about how soccer culture is different there and maybe when in your career you developed a fan being a fan like are you a Chelsea fan now or kind of (laughs) speak a little bit about that experience and when if ever that kind of really became part of your soccer journey yeah so I didn't watch a whole lot of football when I was very young I would say like I started watching uh soccer when I was like in college, that's when I was like, all right, you know, Anson was on his, be a fan of the game, be a fan of the game. So I was like, all right, Anson, I will be a fan of the game. Um, I think I started really paying attention to Chelsea then, but you know, I can't say that I knew all the players or I knew their tactics or anything, but I just think that that was the team that I was watching more often than, than others. Um, and then obviously I go into the pros play at Washington spirit. Um, and then there was a year 2000 at the end of 2016 that I, felt like it was time in my career for me to change it up, you know, playing in the league. I always knew like, you know, being an American soccer player, you're always going to find your way back home, you know? So I think it was, it was time for me to really make a change and and do something drastic in my career. And that was just the time that I felt like I was most comfortable with. It was far enough away from the next world cup where I was like, okay, even if I'm out of sight, um, you know, I feel like I have time to kind of make my push to make that world cup roster. Um, but when I got to England, it was, it was incredible The the tactical, um, sessions that we would do was just, you know, I felt like I was a, a proper student, you know, we would have meetings and, and, um, sessions like classroom sessions every day, almost twice a day, most weeks. And, um, I just learned so much about the sport. I learned about myself. I learned that I'm not just this player that's athletic or fast and that I have so many other tools in my box to use, which is, you know, breaking down pressure, playing in between spaces, being tighter with the ball, things like that. So I feel like I had to leave um, 
the NWSL to really experience that just because the setup is different. The, the opposition is different. Um, but I really enjoyed my time there. I learned so much. And I feel like when I came back to the NWSL, I was, you know, ready to break down opponents in, in multiple ways and I, in ways that I never knew that I actually was capable of doing. That, that's so interesting. And I love hearing you talk about the nuances that, that you picked up there. Cause I remember one time after you came back, actually we spoke and you were talking about how precise I remember you used that word. Cause I loved it. How precise everyone there was technically. And I'm curious, um, just in that observation, like, do you think, um, do you think we as a U.S. culture should kind of go in line with more of what's going on in England? Should we pave our own path? Like, how do you see this playing out? I know, obviously, um, we're a little young soccer culture wise compared to some of the European soccer culture. So do you see that, you know, we should follow some of what's going on there or is it just going to be different here no matter what? Um, I think there's definitely things that you can take from other cultures. Like, uh, you know, I don't, believe that I exist, exist in a world where I feel like I can't learn anything from any other person or, or culture or place. Um, so I think for me, you know, I think American soccer is definitely going to be very much American soccer. Uh, but at the same time, you know, I truly value how other countries prepare or, you know, I've always loved how Japanese players are so precise at such a young age and it's, it's their training mentality. And it's things that I'm like, Oh, we can for sure appreciate that. And, 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 take that into our own culture. But at the same time, um, I do think Americans have a certain way of, of playing. Uh, just our culture in general is very much, you know, the American mentality. And I don't think we'll ever get away from that. But I do think through my experience of going overseas and, and embracing a new culture and a new style of play has allowed me to grow. And, and I said before, it's allowed me to grow in a way that I don't think I would have um, been able to if I didn't actually take that chance and and go and seek um, you know a new experience. Yeah. So la last question about your time there. I know I believe one of your chickens is named after the club. So yes. how hardcore? How is that? Just like a memory that now you think <laughs> of the club when you see the chicken, or are you like a hardcore Chelsea fan now? <laughs> I'm a hardcore Chelsea fan. Uh, you know, my husband is a Chelsea fan too. So I think like it's just a really nice household. We get along. We have the same sports team that we support. So it's um it's really obviously nice. Um, but yeah, when I have you know my chicken that's also named Chelsea, I think it obviously shows that I'm a real supporter. Um, she's also literally my favorite chicken. She's the smallest one. <laughs> Don't tell the like, other ones that. <laughs> <laughs> I will tell them, I will tell them, but she's the best one. She's so small and so easy to like pick up and, and hold. So like, yeah, she's the best. Okay. So moving on from uh, little Chelsea, the chicken, um, want to hear, you know, back to, back to the U S and the soccer culture here, obviously you now are playing in Portland, which is arguably like one of the most unique soccer cultures out there and, and it's done some really special things in the U S. So I want to hear a little bit about, um, what is it like there? You know, what is it like being part of the club and what do you think makes the soccer culture in Portland really special? Yeah, it's it's actually so funny that life takes you on these crazy rides because like never in my life did I think I'd end up in Oregon, the state of Oregon. Um, I also think playing in the league, you know, Portland is a, a team that everyone roots against, you know, and I remember being on Washington Spirit rooting against Portland. And then the last team I played on North Carolina Cur Courage also rooting against Portland. But, you know, regardless of, you know, being that outsider looking in, I've always respected the culture and um, just the fan base that Portland is able to, to have and the support that everyone just shows every single game. Um, and now being on the thorns, it's, it's such an incredible experience. It's just, it's amazing that you show up to a game, you're playing in a game and there are 15, 20,000 people there cheering you on, you know? And I think in women's soccer right now, we're not there yet in every market. Um, I'd like us to be because I think, you know, women's sports, women's soccer is, is so profitable, but it's about investing in it. Um, and I just think Portland, um, the organization is a testament of investing in women's soccer. Um, and you have to put money in, in order to reap the benefits in the back end. So, um, I just think it's been incredible being a part of this club. It's, it's felt like a family. Obviously I'm happy my husband's there too. So it is a family. Um, but I just think it is the pinnacle of, of women's soccer, especially in the U S right now. And, um, I'm hoping that other clubs, uh, you know, can, can progress and, and get to the same level as Portland, as far as fan base and stuff, because that's what we need. And that's what we deserve.
And it's interesting. I was going to ask you, you know, as you're talking, I was thinking, you know, why, why Portland? And I think the investment is something very clear. You know, if you invest in it and you build out, build it out, there is the interest. And it's, it's honestly amazing having played there. It's like, it's moving. It makes me emotional yeah. almost. Is there something else about Portland in particular, you think, or the club that makes it, you know, makes it work? Or is it really just as, as simple as investing, especially on the women's side? Yeah, I think another big part of it is like how, you know, invested the players are in the communities. I think just, you know, so many projects that we're a part of is not forced. It's people really wanting to to be involved in the community and give back to a community that supports uh, the women's side, obviously, and the men's side. So I think that's really, you know, been the biggest change is like that interaction, that relationship that you have with people in the community, because, you know, like I said, it feels like a family, so it can't be one-sided. Um, and I think the players um, know and appreciate the fans for always showing up and, and cheering as loud as they possibly can every single game night. But it starts with that relationship and, and wanting to get to know, you know, who makes up the city. Like, you know, when you look people, you know, look at people from the ground into the stands, you want to know, like, these people obviously give back so much to the community and we want to do the same. Yeah, that's really that's really interesting and cool to know because I didn't I didn't really know that you know I didn't know that there's that that connection which it makes sense that you know it, it builds on um, every every little connection really builds that fan base. So taking things uh, broader, just looking again at the culture of soccer in the U.S. You talked a little bit about like the mentality in comparison to England and some things that make U.S. soccer culture unique. What mm. do you think, like what aspect of soccer culture in the U.S. most defines us all, whether it's players, fans, like everything going on here? I mean, definitely our mentality. I think we have developed this over time. This wasn't something that sprung up. It definitely stems from the 1999ers who have paved the way, obviously, for women's soccer in this country, who just kind of instilled this idea that we don't give up. We don't give in. Even if we're down three goals, like we are winning this game, you know, that mentality that we will always be that team, the last team standing um, is something that doesn't come overnight, like I said. So um, I just think every time I've always played on this team, it could, it, regardless of who we're playing, obviously we show respect to our opponents, but at the same time, we understand like it's us versus them. Like we, we got it. As long as we have each other, we have that mentality and we bring that every single game. Like it's that, that acknowledgement that we will be that last team and we will, you know, achieve everything that we set out to achieve. So it's, it's, it's actually incredible. Um, I think with that being said, women's soccer is always changing. I don't think that having a great mentality is always going to, to win you games. I think it's important that we acknowledge that you need more, you know, but I think if you start off with just having that, you will always have a very good chance of winning that game. Yeah. And, and you said a few things in there that I really want to delve into because I think it's so interesting. And obviously, since you started out with the national team, I believe 2013, was that like mm -hmm. when you first kind of came onto the scene with the full team because you were part yes. of the youth teams? Um, obviously, the team itself has had some ups and downs. You've had ups and downs in terms mm -hmm. of a disappointment of not making that first World Cup roster and then mm -hmm. coming back really strongly. H have things changed on the team? Is there a, a trend for the team that you've seen? Has it been pretty much consistent, but then your experience growing into being more a veteran player has changed. Like, how would you do? <laughs> um, I don't know if I could say like the cultural culture has actually changed that much, but I think, yeah, when players retire and they're no longer in the group, like things are going to change, you know? And I think when I first got on the team, you know, Abby was still there. Boxy was still there. Christine Rampon was still there. There was so many players who have achieved so much in this sport who have like, you know, who were there when I was, was a, a young pup on the team. Um, and then since then, obviously you have newer people, younger people coming in. And I think we still hold on to what makes this team special, which is our mentality, which is our strong culture, our ability to stay unified. Even if we're all not best friends, it's about achieving that common goal. And I think that's been the strongest part of our culture is understanding that we're with each other for long periods of time. We basically are family, whether we, like I said, love each other or not, we are all we have, you know? So I think that has been um, 
the most consistent part of it. But with new people coming in, people leaving, you know, things are always going to change just about, you know, just even ability on the field, like, you know, getting used to a certain type of person that you usually play with. And if they're no longer in the environment, then yeah, you have some adjusting to do. But um, everyone's journey is obviously kind of like this. I don't think anyone has literally always felt like that's life. So, you know, just even through my own experience, it's like, yeah, I've been knocked down a couple of times in this environment, but I've tried to just always remain committed to, you know, myself to be the best version of myself in this environment, but to be the best teammate, you know, because there's a lot of days where things aren't going great in my own career, but I show up, I try to, you know, make people laugh. I try to lighten the mood. And to me, that's, that's my service to the team. Um, and I don't think if I didn't provide that, then I would be passionate enough to stay in this environment because there are some days that are not great here. So um, it's about embracing those days and and trying to get back to the, the best version of yourself that you could possibly be. Yeah. I mean, I can attest to that. You're bringing the laughs and it's really important because I think people don't realize how hard it can be. Like it's a different set of challenges. I think people think about getting there is the goal. And that is for Mm -hmm. 99.9% of of kids who play is like getting there is everything. But then once you're there, it's not, it's not easy. It's not every day feels good, but Mm -hmm. you know, you do, you do bring that really great uh, spirit (laughs) to everything you do. So, and I, and I've appreciated it over time so much. Um, Are there young players coming up now that you're particularly excited about or a young player coming onto the scene or maybe going to be coming onto the scene that you're like this, we should all watch this player? Yeah. I mean, obviously I've gotten to know Sophia Smith really well, obviously playing um, on the thorns with her. um, And she was obviously in some camps leading into um, the Olympics. So she's obviously a young player that I am really hopeful for. I think um, she has some amazing qualities. Um, I just think with every young player, it's now about, you know, finding who you are. Um, you know, and, and and not just getting by on talent because everyone here is talented. Um, so now it's about honing into what makes you special and just, you know, strengthening all your strengths and and also working on your weaknesses. But I'm, I've been really excited to play with her on the thorns and now having her in camp has been really great. And I always try to make sure I check in on her and just, you know, even though we don't play the same position, I think it's it's still important to really connect and, you know, ask questions and see how people are doing. Because I know when I was young, I wanted that and and I needed that desperately at times. And, you know, just having anyone come up to me and ask me how I was doing, you know, made all the difference um, and made me feel seen. It made me feel like, you know, I'm not just here to hold someone's space, like, but I was actually here to really compete and and make a name for myself. Yeah. And that's a, it's wonderful to hear you talk about how your role has shifted from being the one who maybe needed that to now being able to provide it, even though I think everyone still needs that from time to time. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. (laughs) Um, So what, speaking of that, do you have a vision of yourself in the future, like past your playing days or, or maybe even, you know, later on into your playing days, like who is crystal five or 10 years from now? I know that's a tough one, but I'm really curious what you think your role is going to be in all this moving forward. Yeah. I mean, I think I can safely say, I don't know if I would get into coaching. Um, the licenses you need for that is so crazy. Um, I hear the girls have been enjoying it, obviously being able to do it together. I think they're onto their like B license now. So like, that's really exciting. Um, I don't know if I want to get into coaching, but I do want to stay involved in, in, in women's soccer. I think I almost feel like I have a sense of responsibility to, to stay in the sport, at least for a little bit. You know, I don't know if, 40 years later, I'll still be in it. But I do think at least um, right when I am done, I want to, you know, help run organizations, um, whether that's, you know, me being, you know, somewhat of a GM, um, being able to, to build cultures and, you know, really make sure that if a team is, you know, trying to build a team that they're choosing the right people, not always just the best players, but people that fit um, with the organization and the, the the ideals of what that organization stands for. So um, I love team building. I don't know why. I mean, I was a social major in college and I think I just really enjoy, you know, how people can work well together and the connection between individuals, because I think that's what drew me into like wanting to be in a team sport is understanding that you can't do it alone and as, as an individual, but you can achieve so many incredible things as a collective. So, yeah. 
Well, well, I'm excited to see where, where that takes you. Um, we still I mean, got yeah, you can hire me if you, <laughs> <laughs> you got a lot of time on the field. We'll talk about that in a few years, but, but, um, just for everyone listening, what Crystal was referring to with the coaching licenses is, uh, NWSL and U.S. Soccer have come together to provide opportunities for current players to get their coaching licenses. And I feel a little bit similar to you, Crystal, when I see how much work goes into that. I am amazed. It's incredible. Um, But speaking about NWSL a little bit, what do you think the league's impact is on the soccer culture here kind of off the field? Like how has NWSL pushed things forward or if not enough, like where does NWSL need to push things forward? Yeah, I think the NWSL has been growing, um, since it's inaugural year, obviously. Um, I think there's way more sponsorships. Uh, there's way more people wanting to invest in this game. I do think we have some work that needs to be done. still. I think our games can still be more accessible to people. Um, I would love for us to get an ESPN deal or an FS1 deal. Um, and I just think that unfortunately, you're going to, we're going to miss out on, on fans who like don't want to pay $5 a month, you know, and, and we have to be okay with that. Obviously right now it's good that we have some sort of setup where people can watch the games consistently. And I think it has been um, said that it's a lot better uh, than past years, but, you know, to me, we deserve to be competing with the MLS for, for, you know, prime time, like TV slots. So um, that's where I would love to see the game grow um, into. I think we, like I said, are making strides. Um, I think right now, for those that don't know about the NBSL, we are making a lot of changes um, in the coaching department. And I think what we're going to find next year going into 2022 is that we're going to see some new faces potentially. Um, And hopefully that brings, you know, new styles of play or um, just some more excitement, even more excitement about the NWSL. So I think those are some changes that are coming. And um, I think people are fired up and, and, you know, really going to embrace the new faces that we see in the, in the league next year, obviously with two new, two new, two new teams coming in. I think that that's a huge sign of growth. Um, And, you know, I think this league is just going to continue growing and growing, but I'm just hoping that it doesn't have to take 20 more years that we can kind of get this ball rolling even faster, but those two topics I think are, are really important and I'm excited to see what next year is going to um, look like. Yeah. And, and kind of uh, speaking about NWSL and some of your, you play a huge part in all of this, I think just as a, as a figurehead in the league. And I'm curious for you to tell us a little bit about the black women's players collective and like, what, what should we know about what you guys are doing and I, how did it all start? Give it, give us the full picture of um, what you, your work is about. Yes. So the Black Women's Player Collective um, was started at the end of last year. We basically, a group of us, me, Margaret Purse, Lynn Williams, Jasmine Spencer, Jamia Fields, Imani Dorsey, and Ifioma. We started a group uh, just, you know, wanting it to be like a support group kind of, you know, after the events that took place in 2020, we felt like Black players on teams were really struggling because There's not many of us. So we were often left with the burden of leading team discussions and answering a lot of questions and trying to really educate people on, you know, why the world is in a place that it's in now. You know, I think 2020 shocked a lot of people, but I think most black people in the world were kind of like, this is normal. Like, sadly, this is this is been done before. And unfortunately now it took a video going viral and being seen by many for people to really wake up, you know? So I think, um, you know, we formed this group to really allow people a safe space to speak and, um, voice their concerns and and their, their struggles that they've been going through. And I think eventually we turned that group into a nonprofit and wanted to make some long lasting, impactful change, um, in soccer in the U S. Um, so a lot of our initiatives is really, drawn towards, um, you know, elevating the representation of of just Black women in general um, and just, you know, trying to draw awareness to how we are perceived by society, how we are judged um, even before we, you know, step on the field or step into a business, the business world. So, it's you know, that was our main thing was really, even though we are soccer players, allowing people to, um, you know, be elevated as just Black women in general. Um, and then a lot of our initiatives definitely are geared towards 
um, pr uh, providing scholarships for young um, black girls to play because this sport is a pay to play model um, in the US, which definitely limits people to g even gain access, obviously, into it. So we want to set up programs that can you know, allow kids to play club soccer. Um, and we also opened up a lot of mini pitches with U.S. Soccer Foundation. So we're really trying to do it all, but we also understand that we are very much player led. So we have to kind of gradually get going. But um, we're, you know, so excited. It's, it's a necessity that we need in this league. We also do get on calls and have conversations with Lisa Baird, the commissioner of the NWSL from time to time on just anything that we feel strongly about or any changes that can be made. So it's been nice to feel like we are that avenue for change. Yeah, and I, just a couple more questions, I think, about this, because I this is really, obviously, we talk about NWSL and the U.S. Women's National Team and how it affects the general culture of our country, because the reality is that you guys, um, as players in the NWSL, as U.S. Women's National Team players, are the people that many, many young girls and boys look up to. So the fact that... Um, you know, a, gr a group of black women is taking the initiative to make this kind of change. I think it's hugely impactful, larger than the sport. Um, how do you feel that being a black woman athlete is unique to maybe the experience of some of the black men? And obviously you can only speak from your own experience, but what is, you know, how is that unique? Yeah. So one, I think being a black woman is always seen as a double negative or a double disadvantage is what I say, which is we are black and we are also women. So I think our experiences are a little bit different just because our male counterparts um, often get a little bit more of a pass in the world just because they are men. So there's things that they are given or, or you know, they're born into to society already with some sort of benefits that, you know, me just because I'm a woman don't receive. Um, but I will say we work closely with the, the black players for change and, even them inviting us into the room and, and having us on calls and leading discussions has been a really great sign of growth because I think for a long time, black women sometimes don't even feel like black men even give us that, that you know, right to, to use our voice or to be seen. So it's actually been a really good um, cultural shift within the black community, which I've been really excited about and, and very appreciative about because I do think that black women are fighting a little bit of a separate battle than our, our male counterparts, but um, I think we're judged more on our image and our looks a lot more than, than black men. I think there is a high level of racism, definitely more in, in male sports. I don't think um, women face it as much. I think it's definitely prevalent and it exists, but I don't think it is as, you know, it, it's not to the degree that it is on the men's side, but I think Black women often feel like we have to be so beautiful and so amazing, like top, you know, whatever, like past level 10 in order to be seen, heard and and treated fairly. So I think a lot of um, just being a black athlete has always made me feel like my image has to fit what people want to see, you know, and it's really hard to do that in a white dominated sport because I often feel like because I am black, I might not get the deals or I might get not get seen because that's probably not what they're trying to market. You know, it's 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 a sport that I very much feel like I'm almost uh, an outsider in. So uh, everything you've said, I think, has spoken to this very eloquently, by the way. So I appreciate you sharing these mm -hmm. thoughts. But what's the personal legacy that you hope to leave on the game? Like, uh, in the one day that I don't want to see anytime soon when you do, you know, hang up your boots from playing professionally. Like what would you like people to say or think about you? Um, yeah, I would like my legacy to definitely be a lot about my versatility. I think like I've been able to leave a mark in this game on like just, you know, adding tools to your kit and just be going with it, you know? So I think my versatility is definitely a big part of my legacy, but I think, for me, how I want to leave this game is, is knowing that for a long time I had to be, you know, one of, if not the only one, but I hope when I leave this game that I feel like I have allowed and, and pushed for more diversity in the sport. And, you know, I think my first two years on this team, it was probably like me and one other, maybe it was me and like press, I think, you know, and I think now when I fast forward, when I'm hanging up the boots, um, I think I want to look back and say like, 
wow, like I really hope that I helped push for more, for, you know, more girls to feel like they can stay in the sport and, and feel like they can be seen and that, you know, their image is beautiful and that, you know, they are, you know, able to really impact this game. Um, because I think like, when I look back, it's like black women are actually in soccer, but I think like they drop out at a certain age, obviously, because maybe they don't think that they will go on to play pro. But I think like we are here, but we just need to feel like we belong, you know, and because there's not many of us at the top, I think it's not easy to see yourself wanting to continue on because you're like, it's not a sport that feels welcoming or feels like it's inclusive uh, for me to to want to stay in it. So, you know, I hope there's more of us that make it to the top, top level, because I think it'll definitely push people to want to stay in the sport even longer. Yeah. Well, like I said, don't hang up the boots anytime soon, <laughs> but no, it's, it's really powerful what you're saying and it's bigger than the game. Um, mm-hmm. So I want to wrap up with three kind of quick hitters, um, okay. putting you on the spot a little bit, but there are things you already talked about. So um, first, what's most American about U.S. soccer? Most American about U.S. soccer? I mean, our like grit and our mentality, like just like it's us versus everybody. We're going to win. Like, you know, we're going to obviously respect the others, but at the same time, it's like, no, we're going to outwork you. That That is a very us mentality. Yes. That's a very <laughs> us mentality. <laughs> okay. What's the greatest soccer market that no one knows about or is yet to have a team in your opinion? Ooh. Wow. No one knows about and yet to have a team. I feel like they all have a team now. I say, I think like on the women's side, you're saying or on the men's side, either one, just an American soccer market. That's kind of an undiscovered. Well, I think it's now discovered, which is LA. I think LA is obviously this market that like, yes, it breeds sports teams, obviously, but haven't had a women's team there since what was the professional women's team there? The LA Soul, LA which was Soul. yeah, in 2009. Yep. Exactly. So I think LA coming into the to the NBA Cell next year is actually gonna be incredible because it's a market that should have had women's sports there for the longest, but you know, whatever. We're here now. So I think LA. Yeah. And you might have answered this one already, but just in case you, something else comes to mind, what's the most American soccer market and why to you? American soccer market. Gosh, I don't think I answered that. That's hard. I don't even think I have an answer. Oh, I didn't know if it was one we talked about or one that, yeah, the most American in your mind. Well, I'm going to say the Portland area because like we have bomb fans and like, I mean, yeah, when people are thinking of American women's soccer, it's like Portland, you know? So I'm going to say Portland. That's a good one. Yeah. I was saying it could have been something we talked about, but I I wasn't sure. (laughs) Well, Crystal, I, I so appreciate, uh, the conversation, I always love talking to you. And I think, you know, what you talk about is always bigger than the game. It's about, you know, bringing joy to your atmospheres. It's about Mm -hmm. who you are in the world and and leaving your mark on not just the sport, but everyone else out there. So really appreciate your energy, your insight and everything you shared today. And I, I hope we have many more of these conversations. Same. Thank you for having me. 